In this lesson, we're going to take a look at template classes. So we can template classes just like we can template functions. Thus, we can create different instances of classes templated on different types. That is, they will contain different types of data. So there are rules that we have to follow, of course. The usual rules for templates, that is, the code for template classes, just like template functions, must be placed above main if you're working with a single file program or has to be placed in a header file for multiple file programs. Also, the definitions for the functions associated with that class must follow that class definition in the same header file or for an extra level of obfuscation, you can place those definitions in an HPP file which is also non-compilable, and a pound include command is appropriately placed in the .h file. So here's an example of how that's done. We have on the left the .h file with the usual preprocessor commands, the pound if and def, and the pound define there, and the pound and if here. Notice then we have our definition of the templated class followed by a pound include for the .hpp file. The .hpp file will contain the definitions of the various functions contained in that class. Okay, there are syntax rules also. Number one, the class definition has to be templated, it has to be labeled as a templated class. This is your communication with the compiler telling compiler that indeed it is to be templated. And all the functions contained in the class have to be templated. All right, for a demonstration of how this works, I'm going to take a look at one of the basic data storage techniques in computer science in programming, and that is a stack. I like to demonstrate a stack uh, with something that we might all be familiar with, and that is a stack of dishes. If you go to a cafeteria, there is a cabinet at the beginning of the cafeteria line that contains a stack of dishes that come out of the washing machine. Notice that you are only able to access the very top plate on that stack. This is what we call a first-in, last-out uh, storage device or uh, storage technique. The first plate into the cabinet is the last plate out, or the last one in is the first one out. The common terms used for stack access is push and pop. When you push, you're putting something onto the stack. When you pop, you're taking something off of the stack. Thus, we see that we have a, a, a stack of plates here, and the top data element has the value 12, and we want to put 25 onto the stack. So we push it onto the stack, and notice then we see only the top of the stack. We see the 25. We cannot see the next data element, which we happen to know is 12, but we can't see it. We want to push something else onto the stack. Let's say we want to push 32. Then, again, all we can see is that 32, the top plate. Now suppose we want to pop. So if we pop, we pop 32 off of the stack, and then we can see that 25 on top. We can pop it. It is now off of the stack of data, and we can see the top element, which was a 12. So here's our example. Here's the C++ code, and you'll notice then the keywords used for identifying uh, this code as a templated class. We have at the top template class T element. This tells the compiler that this is a templated class. That's the uh, required syntax. And then uh, a lot of everything else in this example is uh, as you would expect. We have the definition of the class, class stack. We have the private and public sections. Notice that the data for this type of thing consists of two data elements. One is a static array of max elements. We call it data m underscore data, and it's a, an array of t-element items. 
T element is our template parameter. That is, T element stands for, or is in place of, the type that is going to be instantiated eventually. So in private, then, we have some type of uh, array of max elements. And secondly, an int, num elements, that tells us how many elements are in the stack currently. OK, in public, we have a constructor. Notice that the constructor, whose definition is inlined, does nothing more than set num elements to 0, which is a reasonable thing to do. Anytime you want to create a stack, you want it to be empty. You don't want it to be preloaded with some sort of data. That just simply doesn't make any sense. Notice then we don't have to do anything at all with the array. There is, of course, uh, information in that array, but we don't care what it is because we set num elements to be 0, which in effect tells us that anything that's in that array is garbage. It's just junk. The second element in our list of functions is a copy constructor. I include it simply to show you the syntax. When you refer to a stack now, you cannot refer to it as just a stack, but it has to be a stack of t elements, a stack of t elements. Also notice in the definition of this class, when I refer to stack, I only refer to stack. I don't have to refer to it as a stack of t elements unless I am identifying a specific type, as I have in the uh, copy constructor. I said that I want a, a constructor that takes some object of the type stack. Well, we don't have a type stack. What we have is a type stack of t elements. We have our definitions for push, pop, and we have some helper functions, is full and is empty. So let's take a look at the push and pop. I'm going to have those functions return bool, that is, true or false. Either something can be pushed onto the stack or it can't be. Something can be popped from the stack or it can't be. And I'm going to use the parameter list for the function to either represent the item that I'm pushing onto the stack or retrieve the item that I am taking off of the stack. Notice then when I push it, then it's a const value element parameter. And when I pop it from the stack, it's going to be a non-const reference parameter. That is, what is popped is going to be returned through a reference parameter. This allows me to use the return type for bool to tell whether or not it's actually going to occur. So we ask the question, then, why can we not push something onto a stack or not pop something from the stack? Well, because I've used a static array to represent the data in this construct, if the array is full, I can't push something onto it. Likewise, if the array is empty, I can't pop something from it. And we'll take a look at a demonstration of how that works in a later slide. So I'm going to use these helper functions is full and is empty. Is full and is empty both return bool, true or false. If it's full, well, that means that the number of elements is the same as max. That's the declared size of the array. And if it's empty, then that means the number of elements is zero. OK, so moving right along, let's take a look at our push function. Now. Here I've written it as if it was to follow the definition of the class, either in a, its own header or above main. Uh, I could likewise put it in .hpp, which I'm going to show you in the next uh, file. So notice also that the template syntax rules require me to identify this function as a uh, templated function. And notice also that when I'm scoping that function, I have to scope it as a stack of t elements, not just a stack, but a stack of t elements. Okay, the definition is very simple. If not full, then the data element in the array, uh, numbered num elements, or indexed num elements, is going to be assigned whatever uh, ELM is short for element. So whatever it is you're going to push is going to go into that array. Then I'm going to increment 
num elements, okay, because now I have one more, and I'm going to return true. Otherwise, I'm going to return false. No, notice that I don't need an else there, because if is full is not true, then simply return false. I'm not going to do anything else. Uh, notice also I have said in the past that you want to avoid multiple returns in your functions. Here's an example where it is acceptable. It's fairly standard practice in a case like this. If I was to put this definition into an HPP, then this would be in stack.hpp. And again, notice I have template class T element. I have T element and I have T element. That is the template parameter. Okay, for the pop, also in stack.hpp, again, I have to identify the function as being a templated function, and t element is my template parameter. And the definition is, again, straightforward. If is not empty, then I'm going to assign to elm element, that's my reference parameter, the element that's in that static array index num elements minus one. Remember, num elements is the number of elements in the array, and it, in essence, is an index into the first available empty slot. So I have to subtract one from that to find the very last element in the, in the array. Then I'm going to decrement num elements, and I'm going to return true. Otherwise, I return false. And the copy constructor, which can also reside in uh, stack.hpp, we have, once again, the template class T element and T element and T element as identifying the template parameter. Once again, notice that I need to identify not just a stack, but a stack of T elements. That is the type. Uh, there is no type called stack. It's stack angle bracket T element. So how do I copy? Well, the number of elements for the constructed object is the number of elements for the source object, and I simply jump into for loop to copy over the elements in the array. So I copy the size of the array, copy the array. So let's take a look at an example. All right, so I can create a stack, but I have to instantiate the template parameter, and in this case, I'm going to instantiate the template parameter with int. So what happens at this point? At this point, the compiler will copy the code from the header file, the general layout of the stack code, and replace t element with int. It then compiles that code, because now the template parameter has a type. Compiles it. If it compiles fine, then you have an object of type stack with uh, int being the data type, and I've chosen to call it antil. So a stack of ints is an antil. That's computer science humor. You should appreciate it. I'm going to create a single int value called a value, and in my next line of code, I'm going to pop from my antil and pass in a value. What value do I get? Well, in this case, this function call will return what? It returns false. That function value is not used in this code, of course. It's just thrown out the window. A value doesn't take on any value, least of all from that array, because there was nothing in that array, nothing in that stack. So that's a pretty useless line of code. All right. Now let's push 5 onto the stack. So anthill.push5 puts 5 into the zeroth element of that array. I'm going to push 6. That puts 6 into the first element of the array. And then I'm going to pop a value. And what happens? 6 comes off and is placed into a value. Notice it is actually removed from the array. Step 2. I can create a class called elephant. A couple of private data elements, a weight and a name, and uh, in public we've got a constructor and some function to do something. And then I can declare a stack instantiated on elephant. 
because I have that type now, which we'll call a pachyderms. So a stack of element elephants is a pachyderms. That is more quality computer science humor. All right, I can create a farm class, a templated class, templated on my template parameter t animal. We have in public a constructor, sets the herd size to zero, and in private we've got a, an array of uh, t animals called my herd, and of course an int to represent the size of the herd. And then again, I can create a farm of elephants, which I will call large animal branch. And so I have used my templated classes to create objects with different data types, instantiating the template parameter. And that's the end of this session.